Michigan. When someone says the word downriver, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? River? Boats? South? Birds? How about the first automobile bridge downriver? Behind me is the Gros Eel Toll Bridge, the first bridge to Gros Eel for vehicle traffic. Built between 1912 and 1913 by owner of the northern end of Gros Eel, Edward W. Voigt. Voigt was a well-known businessman in the community, one of the founders of Detroit Edison Company, owner of a large beer brewery, a ferry boat company, founders of Detroit Museum of Arts, Miles Theater Company, and Voigt Parks in Detroit. He foresaw the need for improvements in transportation to and from Gros Eel. Edward W. Voigt was born in Doibeln, Saxony, Germany on April 5, 1844. His father brought him to America in 1854 when he was 10 years old. Voigt followed his father in business taking over a beer brewery he had established in the 1860s. Under the Junior Voigt's leadership, sales increased and he eventually bought the business from his father. His product soon became one of the most popular in the city and the capacity of his brewery grew from 3,000 barrels annually to more than 43,000 barrels, which was then the largest brewery production in the state of Michigan. Voigt's business ventures expanded beyond brewing and he became one of the most prominent businessmen in Detroit during this era. He was one of the founders of the Edison Illuminating Company, which was the forerunner to Detroit Edison. He founded the Port Huron, Suffet and Paper Company and was involved in railroad ventures among other business activities. Voigt was also a major real estate developer in Detroit who assisted in planting the lots and building streets for a very desirable neighborhood along Woodward Avenue, now known as the Boston Edison Historic District. On Gros Seal, Voigt owned and ran a large horse farm known as the Island Homestock Farm which was located on part of the 400 acres of land he owned on the north end of the island. He raised Percheron horses on the farm that his brewery used to transport beer barrels in Detroit. He also owned a ferry boat service that was one of the few businesses that regularly carried people and goods to and from Gros Eel. transported his Percheron horses from the farm to the mainland with the ferry boat. This experience became an ambitious plan to build an automobile bridge on the north end of the island. He felt the automobile bridge would make it easier for the transporting of the Percheron horses to the mainland while also providing Gros Eel residents with a much wanted way of easily and quickly assessing the island with vehicles. At the time, the idea of building an automobile bridge was very popular with Gros Eel residents. However, given there were fewer than 1,000 residents on Gros Seal, and local governments did not have funding to build an automobile bridge to Gros Seal, this project could only be made a reality with private funding. Voigt 
took on the challenge by obtaining the financing and forming the Grosseal Bridge Company on May 1st, 1912. To build the Grosseal Toll Bridge as a self-sustaining enterprise that would serve the public. Voigt was the first president of the GIBC and owned 99% of the shares. The toll bridge connects two downriver communities, the community of Riverview and the community of Grosseal Township. The bridge consists of 900 tons of steel and is over 3,100 feet long, starting over at Riverview at the narrow area and continuing on to the large causeway in Grosseal. The bridge at its highest point is over 90 feet high and it sits about 10 feet above the water. Interestingly enough, there's a smaller bridge, 32 feet wide, which runs along the Grosseal shoreline and it's a small channel. It runs around the small channel there. We need to keep in mind that this was the first bridge connecting the downriver communities with Gros Eel. And because it's a privately owned bridge, there is a toll charge. 2012 marks the 100th year anniversary of the Gros Eel Bridge Company. The bridge can be categorized by engineers as a center pier swing bridge. It was built for functionality reasons to keep the Trenton Channel of the Detroit River open for ships to pass through. The bridge has one pier that rotates for 45 degrees, and the pier always remains in the center. Historic bridge expert Nathan Holt arrives for a visit to explore the bridge construction in a deeper level. The Gross Eel Toll Swing Bridge is a through truss swing bridge with a Warren truss configuration. And what we mean by that is it's a truss bridge and the truss bridge is where we have a series of triangles formed by a framework of steel that hold the bridge together. This is a, the main span of the bridge right here. There's the center pier. You notice that it's halfway in between these piers. That's where the term center pier comes from. And so this is a span that would rotate open. And these two spans on each end of the bridge, on either side of the swing bridge, are the through truss approach spans. And over here is the trestle approach span indicated in the plans and also a short trestle approach span at this end. When we look at the truss span, you can see that Warren truss configuration. It goes, you can see these little V's in there, this repeating V pattern. That's what defines the Warren truss. You can see it both in the swing and the through truss spans. The bridge has what we call riveted connections, and that provides a rigid, solid connection for all these different parts on the bridge. It's the way it's fastened together. Um, they're fastened to these plates called gusset plates. Um, in 1913, this was fairly cutting edge of what was pretty much becoming the standard by that point. Earlier bridges were connected with things called pins, and they provided a much more loose um, connection, and they were easier to assemble without the equipment that became available in the early 20th century. The bridge originally as built had a queen post pony truss approach span. A pony truss is just like the through trusses except it does not have overhead bracing that you drive through, it just had trusses on the sides. And this queen post was replaced several years ago but it was part of the original design. You can see here these are the connections of the bridge or the truss here and this is a similar design as the main and approach through truss spans. They have these same, this is the gusset plate here is a vertical member, these are diagonal members. When we're looking at defining a truss configuration, we look at the diagonal members, and a queen post is a truss that just has this one X in the center, and that's pretty much all it has for diagonals. That defines the queen post. Um, down here you can see, this is the roadway here, and this is the proposed sidewalk that was never built. And so this would have been the railing for the sidewalk, this would have been what we'd call a sidewalk cantilever, and none of this was ever built, just this part was built.
time it takes from the bridge opening to bridge closing for a, for a small craft is usually about five to six minutes. The first thing I do is I hit the signal lights. And that tells the vessel out there that I know, that he knows, that I know that he's there. And according to the instructions on the wall there, it has to be done. So he can't proceed without that signal light going on. The very next thing I do is I turn on the, the bells and flashers. That lets the, that lets the car traffic know that, hey, the bridge is going to be open. Follow that by turning on the red traffic control lights, so green to red. Once I see that the cars are clear, I'll bring the gates down. Once the gates are down, I put the, uh, the control panel, I put it on automatic, I retract the jacks, I disengage the locking pins, I take the clutch and I put it into span position. Sometimes we have to jog, almost always we have to jog the motor to get in that position. Once I'm in span position, I sound the marine horn. It's very loud. One long, one short. See everything's behind the buoys for the piers. The boats are behind the piers. They're not in any way. I open the bridge. And that's a button. Then the bridge opens. It takes about a minute for it to open it up. Then the, then the vessel goes through. Once he's clear of the pier, once he's past the pier, I blow the, I sound the marine horn one long, one long uh, blast, and then I close the bridge. Now, when the bridge is closing, there's an alignment process. But you have to get the bridge to align to the roadway exactly, and it tends to wiggle a little bit, and that takes about a minute. And once it's perfectly aligned, I engage the locking pins. Once the locking pins are engaged, I put the clutch to jack position. Then I extend the jacks, raise the gates, turn off the bells and flashers, turn off the signal lights, and there you go. big freighter it could be like 20 minutes because you open it up very soon because he can't stop and he's, he's a lot of weight you know there's there are thousands of tons of uh, in that ship there and it's not like a car he can't stop so we open it well well as soon as he commands us to open it we open it for most of its history, the operation of the toll bridge has been uneventful. However, there have been two major accidents involving lake freighters over the years. The first in 1965 and the second in 1992. On the August 6, 1965 accident, the lake freighter John T. Hutchinson lost control while traveling up the river and hit the fixed span on the island side of the bridge. The ship's bow crimpled one span and seven men threw themselves in the water for safety. Three cars were knocked down the river, but fortunately no one was hurt. The estimate of the damage for the bridge was $100,000. My name is Bill Heinrich. I lived on Grosio for 83 years, almost 84 years. Uh, I was uh, retired at the time that the 1964 accident happened. I retired very young. I built a boat yard in Gibraltar. I had a boat in my boathouse on West River Road. I received a phone call. A freighter had hit the toll bridge. I was always very, very interested in the toll bridge because my one of my father's uncles was one of the founders of the toll bridge. He was the first treasurer. And uh, I got in my Chris Craft 22-foot sea skiff and hightailed it up here to the toll bridge to see what, what was going on. Unfortunately, I was too late. The freighter had been towed away and uh, the Coast Guard uh, boat and several other cruisers were mulling around. I took my camera with me, thank God, 
and uh, I took some color slides. Uh, there was three or four cars on the west, or excuse me, the east uh, span of the bridge, the Grosse Eel side of the span, uh, that had been knocked in the water, and the cars were mostly in the water. Uh, and uh, so I snapped quite a few pictures. Uh, uh, went home and uh, got on the phone again to inquire about a few things. Got a hold of my friend Lee Edwards, who was uh, president of Wyandotte Toy Company. And uh, uh, he had a brand new Cadillac. And he was waiting on the Gross Hill side of the bridge. He, he, at that time, he didn't live in Wyandotte. He lived on Park Lane. And uh, he was waiting on the Gross Hill side of the bridge. And he saw this freighter coming. And uh, he said, oh, I know what's going to happen here. He was an experienced boater. And uh, he said he slowly got out of his car and walked back to the to the span on the on the east side. And he said, I got off of it just in time. <laughs> and uh, it was it was funny. I, brand new Cadillac. He got another brand new Cadillac out of this thing. Uh, this was quite an experience. I wish I'd taken more pictures. And here the the boat accident in 1965. It was a nice day. I almost remember it like it was like it was yesterday. It was a nice day. I was working as a dog warden and my health and license inspector with the city. And uh, the 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 uh, police department only had one man on the desk, which was Lieutenant Leroy Melms, and then Bob Guinea, who was a patrolman, and, and myself. Well, it was it was three o'clock in the afternoon, right around shift change. Bob and I, Patrolman Guinea, were writing up our reports for the end of the day when the phone rang, and uh, Lieutenant Melms answered the phone, and um, we were listening to see. We didn't know what, what was happening. We may have to leave and go on a run. So uh, we heard Lieutenant Melms say, Hi, Vince, how the heck are you? Because we, we always uh, talk to the guy on the bridge. Vince was a very personable guy, and... Uh, We'd stop and say hello because this is a small town and our routine of uh, patrolling the town got pretty small, so we'd stop on the bridge and talk with Vince for a while. Yeah, that's how we got to know him. And uh, he'd say, you're kidding, Vince. No, can't be. You're Vince, you're kidding me. Is that right? Is there, you're kidding me, Vince. And it kept going on like that. So Leroy hangs up the phone. He says, uh, Guys, get over at the bridge. A boat just hit the bridge. And he says, there's people in the water over there. So we jumped in the car, Bob, Guinea, and myself, and we we sailed over there. And we got there, and um, we pulled right up on the bridge. And there was, the bridge had already, it was swung open, and it stayed open. So we could only go so far, and then we'd have been in the water. But they had the barricade. And we looked across the way. And on the other side, as I say the other side, there was a huge freighter. And he was just sitting there, and, and um, we, I looked over and I could see cars. As we were, even when we were pulling up, we could see that the bridge had, uh, the other section of bridge had fallen into the water. And we saw cars on that section just kind of just like, like they were suspended, you know, not sliding into the water yet. And, uh, I thought, oh my God, we're somehow we got to get over there, you know. And then I, right after that, I saw the Grozio police pull up, and they would have had to have gone in the water to go swimming to, get to pick these people up. But, but later we found out that nobody landed in the water. They had all had seen the bridge, and Vince was waving his arms frantically. Get back, get back, you know, and then ba boom, they hit the bridge, and everybody went running and got off of that span before it hit the water. The guys jumped out of their cars and everything. 27 years later, on September 6, 1992, the 730 foot freighter boat H. Lee White lost control traveling down the river and hit the bridge, got one of the approach stands, and knocked them down in the river. As quoted by the Eel camera, the ship missed the east side opening of Grosseal Bridge by about 100 feet. The freighter was headed south to McLeod Steel in Trenton, 
with a load of iron ore pellets. As a result of the accident, the ship was stuck in an angled position for about 12 hours, with the bow wedged against the bridge and the stern aground on the mainland. Several cars on the bridge managed to get safely off when the crash appeared inevitable. No one was hurt. The Trenton Channel remained blocked until seven tugboats pulled the freighter out of the mud. Although there was about $250,000 in damage to the ship, crew members said the freighter was deemed fit. My name's Ted Kovach. Uh, I was uh, project manager for J.S. Alberici Construction Company. And uh, uh, when, the, when the bridge went out in September uh, 1992, and I believe it was September 6, 1992, and uh, my wife and I was traveling uh, in the neighborhood, and we had heard what had happened on the radio, and uh, I told her, uh, uh, you know, what was going on, and she says, well, you know, I think the owner of the bridge company comes into the restaurant where, where my wife was working. It was my sister's restaurant. It was called Kathy's Cafe on the island. And um, I said, well, you know what? Uh, and this was on a Sunday. I said, tomorrow morning, I says, uh, if, if that owner comes in, Mr. Smoke, um, give him my card. Tell him this is what your husband does and the type of work, the business that they're in, and, uh, and we can help him out if he needs any help. So um, next morning, uh, that happened. Uh, wasn't long after that, that, that same morning, Paul had given me a call. I was at my office, and he had given me a call and asked if I would meet him down at the bridge. My name is Bruce Bird from Ruby Associates. Uh, I'm Vice President of Engineering. Uh, at the time of the, uh, the re replacement of the Girls Hill uh, Bridge Span, uh, I was a project engineer at Ruby Associates. Um, I was called on Labor Day of 1992 by Dave Ruby, who was the principal, the founding principal of Ruby and Associates. Uh, he told me, uh, Bruce, um, there's a problem down at the bridge. There's been a uh, collision, and uh, I need you to come down just as soon as possible uh, because it's been a very serious accident. So uh, that was Labor Day. The, the following morning, I came down to the bridge to see that, in fact, the, a freighter had struck the bridge and uh, knocked it completely off its moorings and into the water, uh, virtually destroying that span. Uh, and we knew that uh, this was the timing of the, getting the replacement uh, span in place as quickly as possible was critical uh, because of the inconvenience to residents. Paul had ended up giving Ruby a contract for the engineering. And then um, at the same time, um, he had us put some packages together to put the bridge out to bid. And uh, so we put together a set of plans and specifications, uh, sent it out to a list of bidders, and the uh, low bidder was then awarded the project. Uh, that company was Alberici, um, located in St. Louis, Missouri, um, and they uh, had got the project to not only um, fabricate the new structure, but also to put it in place. And one of my ideas was for removing the bridge was to incorporate two barges um, and basically hook the two barges, sink the barges down and then hook it to the bridge and then lift the bridge, pump the barges back out and lift the, the damaged bridge out of the water. It brought it over to the land and then we, through a series of, uh, of, of picks where we hooked onto it and moved it in and then we rehook again and moved it in again we we managed to get it up on shore and we did a guesstimate on the weight because it still had the black top the original decking the white pine decking in it and uh it, it was really heavy and then that white pine decking was soaked because it had laid in the water for quite a while there so it had soaked up a, a bunch of water but we guesstimated that the that that old span weighed in the neighborhood of uh, six to 700 ton. The, uh, the bridge was fabricated in uh, Alberici's St. Louis facility. Um, it was um, uh, completely pre-assembled in their shop uh, to ensure that the, uh, the fit-up uh, was correct. 
and uh, once it was uh, assembled, then it was uh, disassembled and placed on trucks and then shipped to Michigan for reassembly on site. Um, the, uh, the bridge was then constructed uh, on the barge and the uh, concrete deck was uh, placed on the bridge. Um, the, uh, we did use a, a component um, called a tension control bolt to uh, mimic the, um, the look of a, a rivet. The tension control bolt is a, uh, is a unique type of, of fastener that has a, a splined uh, end that a, a special wrench uh, attaches to. Uh, the wrench attaches to both the spline and the nut, and as the uh, bolt is, is tensioned, uh, the, the wrench fastens onto this uh, splined area, and when the bolt reaches the proper tension, uh, this spline shears off. So the spline then uh, isn't visible and you end up with, with a bolt that has a, uh, a button head like this that uh, resembles a rivet. If you drive over the Grosse Seal Toll Bridge and you look at that particular span, uh, look closely at the fasteners and you'll see that uh, they don't exactly match or mimic a rivet. They, uh, uh, they have uh, a uh, nut on one side and then a, a button head uh, similar to a rivet on the other. Uh, January 17th. Uh, the work began to install the bridge uh, on the supports. Um, I was uh, at, on the bridge at the time uh, watching closely and uh, the entire process of installing the bridge um, uh, from the time it was unmoored on the, uh, uh, at the landing site to the installation on the, uh, in, in line with the other spans on the, on the piers was only a, a, a matter of about two hours. And uh, once it was put in place, um, the uh, traffic uh, was, was almost immediately uh, opened. Uh, I believe it was only about two hours of, of additional work that needed to be done, and, and then uh, uh, the bridge was open for service. So from uh, the time of uh, the accident, which was Labor Day of, of uh, 1992, to uh, when it was placed in service was about four and a half months, which, uh, considering that it was a competitively bid project, uh, there was an insurance company that was involved, uh, that the bridge had to be fabricated from entirely new components and then assembled on a barge and installed in the middle of winter. Uh, I think that's a, a very impressive uh, track record for uh, Albarisi and, and all the workers uh, that were associated with that project. The toll bridge has one of the most beautiful sites on the Detroit River. Here an endangered species of the common tern comes every late spring and nests in colonies. Many birds and other species occupy the undisturbed wildlife. Downriver historical monuments such as this one are the hidden jewels of Metro Detroit, still waiting for their exploration from all the people who love boats, water, fishing, and sightseeing.